Great. So good afternoon, everybody, and um, welcome to the kickoff of the fall OITE uh, going to graduate school series. Today is really focused on uh, things to think about in choosing where to apply. I'll talk a little bit about um, the actual application, and then I'll tell you what's coming up this fall uh, to help you through the process. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Sharon Milgram. I'm the director of the NIH Office of Intramural Training and Education. I also direct the uh, NIH Graduate Partnerships Program, and I've spent many, many years um, at uh, UNC Chapel Hill directing uh, graduate program there. So I'm going to talk to you um, today and try to give you an insider uh, take on graduate uh, school admissions. Also uh, here today and um, someone that I hope you'll interact with also through this process is Dr. Pat Sokoloff, who is the um, OITE Deputy Director. Pat will be leading the workshop on writing personal statements, and then Pat and I uh, will be available to meet with you and talk with you about your application process and uh, about getting ready for interviews um, and everything that you want to talk about uh, surrounding this process. Just to give me an idea of the audience, how many of you are applying now, you know, this fall? Okay, so most everyone, but not everyone. How many of you are applying to PhD programs um, in uh, biomedical sciences. PhD programs in psychology, um, PharmD, MPH, uh, anything that I haven't mentioned? Okay, so I'll direct my comments largely towards uh, PhD programs. Uh, PharmD doesn't have uh, that much that's different, so I think it will be fine. Uh, MPH programs have a little bit that, that might be different. Um, if you want a focused seminar on applying to uh, public health programs, there is a video cast on our website, um, and all you need to do is go there, and that's training.nih.gov. Go to prior events and, and do a search. The other thing um, before we get started, housekeeping notes, is uh, this uh, Workshop today is going to be taped or is being taped, so I'll ask if you have questions that you get up and go to the mic, okay? If you don't, I'll remind you to do that. If you are watching in Baltimore, Frederick, or Montana, or uh, outside the NIH and you want to ask a question, my email address is right there, and Pat has my uh, BlackBerry, and she'll ask questions on behalf of people um, who are not uh, here. Please, if you're sitting in the audience, don't email Pat your question. <laughs> Just get up and ask it yourself. This is one of my, I, I think lots of you know me and know that I do a lot of different workshops on campus. This is one of my favorite series uh, to uh, participate in because our postbacs do so well uh, in graduate school admissions. Uh, you typically get prepared, you take it seriously, you think it through carefully, you put a lot of energy into your applications. Uh, you make a great impression when you go out and interview and you come back to NIH and make us really proud by all the offers uh, that you get and all the exciting decisions that you get to make. So that is the purpose of this workshop, to give you just a little bit more of an edge in the process, to get you a little bit more ready to point out the mistakes that people can make so that a couple years from now, uh, when I look in the alumni database, I'm going to see each of you at the graduate school you want to be at uh, doing the kinds of things that you want to do. So please take advantage. I only have 17 or 18 slides. We have lots of time. Uh, please ask questions. Um, please uh, follow up with us, and I'll actually give you some instructions on how to do that. Um, we really want to engage you in the process, and we really want to see you do extremely well. So any uh, any application process to graduate school, and it really doesn't matter what the discipline is, uh, really should begin with these three questions. The first one is why, you know, why am I doing this? Why, why graduate school? 
Okay, is there something else that I could do that would take shorter, that would be easier, that wouldn't require as much sacrifice? Am I doing this for myself or I, am I doing this because a teacher pushed me or because my parents think I should or my favorite aunt has been telling me all along, you're smart, you're good in science, you should go to graduate school. Okay, to decide uh, to go for someone else is a terrible mistake that sometimes students make. So I have sat in my office with first year graduate students who are coming to tell me that really they got it wrong and they'd like to gracefully withdraw um, uh, early in the process. And almost every time when I ask what happened, who, who was behind this decision, you know, they admit I wasn't sure, but people were pushing and encouraging and I decided to see if it felt right or good. So I would encourage you, uh, if you're feeling pushed by other people, to step away from that uh, input for just a little while and make sure you yourself can answer the question, why? You also need to ask yourself, where do I see myself in the future? And by that, I don't mean you have to know exactly the job that you want to have, OK? Because you're in a time of exploration, a time of learning. Hopefully, lots of you will change your minds. Uh, you'll, you'll take a class that excites you or have an experience that uh, ignites your imagination, and you'll change. So I don't mean by this you have to know exactly the job you're looking for. What I mean is you have to have some sense of where you're heading. If you see yourself engaged in education, you need to pick a graduate program that helps you develop teaching skills. If you see yourself as a uh, psychologist doing research but also treating patients, you have to pick a graduate program that will prepare you for that. If you're very entrepreneurial and you see yourself either running a company, working in a company, uh, really becoming an entrepreneur in science, you want to find a graduate program that will give you some opportunities to experience the industry side of things. So you need to have some idea where you see yourself in the future. I would say that's not quite as important a question as uh, why do I want to go, but I think that it helps people crystallize their decisions. And finally, the third question is, what kind of graduate school experience will I need to reach these goals? Okay, What do I want to do during graduate school to, to head me in the right direction? So obviously, a big part of graduate school is pretty standard school by school, right? You find a mentor, you join a lab, you do research. Uh, if you're doing uh, non-bench research, you find that research group that has uh, research in your area, you join them, you do research. But there are elements of the graduate school experience that are different uh, school to school. And you want to make sure to pick an experience that supports you. Okay, that fits your personality and most importantly, that will help you reach the goals that you talked about in question number two. So I think this is really important. I think it's so important that what I would like all of you to do is to go home today uh, after the workshop and spend just a little bit of time. You don't need to write a book. You don't need uh, to, to spend a long time uh, putting together uh, uh, a long essay. But if you go ahead and answer these three questions and put them into the body of an email and send them to me, and in the subject put graduate school, okay, then I will uh, take a look at them, print all of them out, and enter everyone who submits an answer into a raffle to win a free book. If I get lots and lots of people, there'll be two free books, okay? So you can uh, increase your chances of winning um, uh, by uh, making sure your friends send one in as well. I need to have them by tonight at 9 p.m., okay? Doesn't have to be long, all right? You might want to sit down later and think about it some more, all right? But anyone who emails by 9 p.m. tonight is in the raffle. Once you answer these questions, once you feel really confident, okay, I know why, I know sort of where I'm heading, enough to start talking about programs, you want to start thinking about different uh, options. I don't need to spend a lot of time here because based on the composition of the audience, I think um, we don't need to discuss every bullet in depth. But there are a variety of programs out there from doctoral programs, uh, not only PhD, but PharmD, PsyD, et cetera. These programs uh, generally have a research element to them, 
although the amount of research will differ uh, in a PsyD versus a PhD program in psychology. When you're thinking about PhD programs in the sciences, in computational biology, in cell biology, in genetics, in microbiology, et cetera, you want to think about three different ones, interdisciplinary programs which allow you to choose coursework and educational experiences from a variety of different graduate programs. There are umbrella programs which allow you uh, to spend your first year or so, typically just your first year, uh, exploring uh, courses and labs in different uh, departments and then choose a department at the end of the year. Or you could go directly into a program or department that is discipline specific. Some schools use interdisciplinary and umbrella interchangeably. Okay. So the language that you're looking for for these broader opportunities to explore widely are typically interdisciplinary or umbrella. Some students often say, I know that I want to do microbiology. So what is the benefit of me doing an umbrella program or a more interdisciplinary program? And I'll answer that um, uh, here for all of you by saying that science really has no boundaries anymore. So in, the, in your career, you will likely meander through a variety of disciplines. Answers to questions will lead to new questions that will take you in different directions. And so exploring uh, in graduate school a little bit broadly and going through uh, an exercise to, to broaden yourself uh, can be positive regardless of where you're heading. For some of you, say, I know I'm interested in cancer biology, or I know I'm interested in some element of virology, but maybe it's at the cellular level, maybe it's about the pathogen, maybe it's at the genomic level. You might find scientists in various graduate programs doing work that interests you. So the benefit then of an interdisciplinary or an umbrella program is that you have access to all of them. So, I would advise you when you pick a school to not only look at departmental based programs but to look at the broader ones. I imagine eventually I'll have to take uh, this slide and modify it because many schools have gone to only offering uh, interdisciplinary or umbrella programs. All right, so you'll, you'll want to make sure you understand the difference. If you are interested in an MD PhD program, appreciate uh, that there are two types that you'll want to be looking for. One are MSTP funded. MSTP is Medical Scientist Training Program. That is an NIH grant program that evaluates MD, PhD programs and funds uh, really uh, stellar programs. MSTP funding means that outside educators, outside scientists, outside physician scientists came, looked at the program, met with the students, said this is really an outstanding place for students to be, and the NIH then chooses to provide some funding. However, there are a tremendous number of outstanding ways to get an MD, PhD at programs that do not have an MSTP. So you don't have to limit your options to MSTP programs. If you're interested in MD, PhD programs, there's a great video cast on our website. If you just go under prior events and search MD, PhD, it'll come up. Masters of Public Health is uh, a, an area um, here at NIH when I talk to postbacs that's really clearly growing. Um, in my first year doing the workshop, there were a couple people in MP, interested in MPHs, and every year it seems to go higher and higher. I would encourage you if you're interested in the public health elements of a microbiology career to look both at PhDs in uh, microbiology, but also look at public health schools, uh, whether that be an MPH or a PhD in public health. There's a great website, whatispublichealth.org, uh, that has a lot of useful resources, and I talked already a little bit about our video as well. So check out that website and check out our video, okay? Once you know what kind of program uh, you're going to apply for, you want to ask yourself uh, probably the other really key question, question number four, okay, after the three I talked to, and that is, am I ready? Okay. So the first question is, am I prepared academically? 
And that doesn't mean did I finish college and have good grades, okay, because by definition everyone in this room ha has done that. It means am I ready for the discipline where I'm heading. So for example, a post -bac, uh that I have been talking to has a really solid foundation in, in biology and biochemistry, but has become completely uh, enamored by computational biology. So academic preparation at the very basic general level, yes. Academic preparation with the right coursework in computational biology, maybe not. All right. So two questions here. Did I do well in what I've done already, which will convince people uh, to take a look? And have I done the right things? The reason it's so valuable to ask that one now, not when a department comes back and says, in general, you look like a good applicant, but the reason to ask yourself this now is that you can still take a course. Or you can write in your essay that you're aware that you need to get experience and uh, some didactic information in this field, and here's how you're going to do it. Okay? Although the, the winter will be very, very busy, um, and it will be difficult, I think, to both interview and take an FAES course. You may decide to be really academically ready for the programs I want. It's worth trying to make that sacrifice. So think about academic preparation both broadly and very specific in the direction that you're heading. The second thing is, do I have research skills? Can I talk about my research? Am I ready? to move to a more independent level of research, which is what's required to be successful in graduate school. I don't think you have to ask yourself, do I know a particular technique? Because going to graduate school is, means going to learn those techniques. But you want to ask yourself, can I talk broadly about research techniques? When I go on interviews and people talk about the work that they're doing, will I have a good general understanding of the techniques involved? Okay. If I am going to make a very strong argument about wanting to do a particular kind of science, is that, base, is that based in some understanding of the research strategies people use? All right. I think sometimes postbacs uh, get wrapped up in asking themselves, can I talk about my own research? And that's one sub part of asking, do I have good research skills? Because to get in, you're going to have to both write about your research and then go and talk about it like you really know what you're doing. All right. But also, think a little more broadly. Okay? Beyond that focus that I have, am I developing a broader base? If you're not, start going to some Wednesday afternoon lecture series outside your field. Okay? Go to a journal club, one of them coordinated by the postdocs through OITE, or one coordinated by your institute, or one within your lab branch. Start paying attention to other people's work, other people's approaches, different model systems. Okay? You want to ask about your problem solving skills. How do I, uh, how do I respond when nothing is working? Okay? How do I figure out a new technique? All right? Have I come up with a good framework that works for me? All right? And if not, now would be a good time to step out of your comfort zone in lab and try to develop some problem-solving skills. Many first-year graduate students who struggle in courses don't struggle because they're, they're lacking the academic preparation. They struggle because they can't read the papers fast enough and with enough uh, understanding. Okay? So if you're not reading papers and pushing yourself now to comprehend them, Now's the time. And I would say read papers in your field, directly relevant, and then go outside a little bit and make sure you can read a paper outside your field. Do you get lost in the details? Do you only read the uh, summary and say, oh, I got it, without critically looking at the details? Uh, can you come up with strategies to read a little faster? Okay. When you sit and talk with people about papers, are you willing to challenge the work? Graduate students are expected to challenge the work that they read. They're expected to come to class ready to critique a paper, not just say, figure one says this, figure two says this, figure three says this. And students will tell, often will tell us, I needed more help in reading papers than I thought. Communication skills. 
from day one, you will be speaking in front of your peers, speaking in front of your faculty, speaking in front of other scientists at your university, and eventually you will be writing, okay? In this regard, being here at NIH is a big advantage. The basic science writing course that we offer is open to postbacs, and although the paper writing course is not open for postbacs uh, without permission, if you have data and you're ready to write a paper, you just need to email uh, the course coordinator, Sean Mullen, and you can also be admitted into basic science writing, I mean, into writing and publishing a scientific paper. Don't leave the NIH without developing your writing skills. If you haven't given a seminar yet, make sure you give one. In your research group, maybe at your institute retreat, you'll present a poster at Postback Poster Day. Look for opportunities to improve your communication skills. My uh, funniest story from my first year in graduate school uh, was the uh, terrible job I did in our graduate student seminar program. And it's funny now because I got through it, but at the time it was pretty traumatic. And your communication skills will help you make a good first impression. So when first year students get up and give their first summary of their research plans, everyone is making a judgment. Okay, and great slides and some poise and a good job of communicating goes a long way. So if I was going to uh, tell you which one on this list was most critical, and I won't really do that because I think they're all critical, but if you push me against the wall, I think I would actually say uh, communication skills are, are really a stress for first-year graduate students. Graduate school will be stressful. So if your time management skills and your stress management skills are not finely developed, develop them, okay? Figure out uh, how you will juggle multiple requirements in school, multiple requirements in lab, and still have a life, albeit maybe a smaller life than uh, you wish. Think about what you're going to do uh, when things get very stressful. Make sure that you're developing interpersonal skills. Am I ready to be assertive with a, new, uh, with a new rotation advisor? Am I ready to stand up in front of a committee and defend my ideas? Am I ready to become a leader within the student group organizing activities? Okay. And all of those, I think, add up to one final question, and that is, do I really want to make the sacrifices that are required? or would there be a better time to do that later? Am I mature enough now to really go ahead and do this? You do not want graduate school to be a protracted negative experience, and in all honesty, it is for some people. All right? You have a lot of power to go in uh, prepared so that it's not. All right? So after you spend some time in the rest of this list, it's worth thinking about, so am I really ready? And uh, if you're not, there's lots of other useful things to do. Finally, I put this on the list because I think life does uh, intrude, and that is, can I do this financially? Graduate students who start graduate school with uh, financial stress need to be prepared to know how they will deal with that. A lot of schools won't let you work. A lot of schools uh, will strongly advise you against it, and if they don't strongly advise you against it, they really should. It's a full-time plus job, all right? So you're going to need to live on a budget, and you need to be ready uh, financially to be able to do that. Some of you will look at some of these things on the list and say, check, got it, feel good about it. You might look at something on the list and say, oh, I better do some work. Please feel free to come by and talk with any of us. Talk with your PIs. Get feedback from the postdocs and graduate students that you're working around. What can I do to improve my communication skills? Do you think I'm being critical enough? Am I being independent? Should I stop asking you for so much guidance? Should I ask for more guidance? All right, look at each thing on this list. Consider where you are. Consider what you can do to get even more ready if you are ready. All right. My guess is you'll think as you get moved through the process of other things that should be on this list, and feel free to email me. Um, I modified it a little bit based on some input uh, from some students 
that left about a year, actually maybe now already two years ago, so it's been a while. Questions about that general, uh, am I ready? Am I uh, where I need to be? I don't think that I need to talk about this a lot, um, especially because all of you are here now as a post -back. But I left it in because occasionally a, a post -back tells me that they'd really like a little bit more time. And there are other options of things to do, particularly working as a technician, either here at NIH or somewhere else, but they take some lead time. All right, so if you're interested in that, if your answer to some of these earlier slides it all adds up to, I'd really like a little bit more time to be certain. Or I am certain, but I don't think I have the academic preparation I needed. Um, come talk to us early enough to get, uh, to get a useful, uh, positive job uh, when you make the next step. So with that introduction, I'm going to assume, since nobody got up and left, that most of you have answered, I'm, I'm ready to go. All right, and you might think about it a little bit and refine that, but you're ready to go. So let's think a little bit about what to consider in looking at a graduate program, okay? Anybody wanna just, I'll repeat back for you uh, so you don't need to go up to the mic. What are some things as you're trying to pick programs that you're considering? Location. Location, what else? what the faculty are actually doing, right? Better be something you're excited about, right? Lots of some things you're excited about. What else? The climate, the morale, is it a, does it feel like a good place or like a tense place? Funding, Funding. am I gonna be supported, right? What else? So I think you hit on some big and important ones. I'm gonna hit on a couple other big important ones for you. Um, and I try to put them within a structure. There is no implied importance by being on slide one or slide two by being at the top of the slide or the bottom of the slide, okay? Absolutely no implied importance. The first thing, actually before I start the list, I wanna say one other thing. Some of this you can't learn up front by surfing the web and talking to people and I acknowledge that and I'll try to point out which ones you really have to wait and evaluate once you get there. But this is my overall list, not just a list for deciding whether to apply, all right? The program focus on teaching and mentoring of graduate students. So my summary for this bullet is good in science does not always translate to good in science education, okay? And there are programs that pride themselves on paying a lot of attention to the training and mentoring of students, and there are programs that say, we'll bring in a bunch of bright people and they'll figure it out, okay? There are programs that have coordinated activities to help you further develop your communication skills, your writing skills, your job seeking skills, your leadership and management skills, okay? So you wanna look for that, okay? There are programs that have strong leadership and oversight of the graduate process. Programs that are making sure students have committee meetings on regular basis making sure that students have access to the information they need to integrate into the department and into the community and into the university. There are programs uh, with directors that every student knows when the going gets tough, I can go see him, okay? And there are programs with absentee directors or less engaged directors, okay? I think that in general, program focus on teaching and mentoring can almost be summarized and add up to attention to controlling time to degree. And by that, I don't mean are there rigid rules that push you out. I mean, is there a whole mechanism in place to promote your orderly movement through the program? So the half time to degree in PhD programs nationally is too long, okay? And we all, I think acknowledge that in the education community. We don't all have strong uh, agreement on how to correct that, but I think it's safe to say that one way to promote uh, uh, timely completion of a PhD is to really provide the students with leadership guidance 
and information along the way. And so you'll want to think about whether the program provides, provides that at all. More details to think about, but very important as well, is the structure of the program, okay? Do they pay stipends? Do they pay, give fellowships? Do you need to teach in return uh, for your funding? Uh, is the funding guaranteed? Uh, is the funding uh, on a competitive basis? Is it enough to live on? How many years will I be funded? Okay. Whether you do rotations or need to pick a research advisor right up front. Lots of biomedical graduate programs now require rotations, not only encourage, but require. Uh, neuroscience programs often uh, have rotations, but some uh, psychology programs do not. Biomedical engineering programs, you'll find some that do, some that don't, all right? And you'll want to know, and people will make uh, strong arguments on both sides. Rotations are good. They let you experience a lab, be sure you like it. They let you broaden your horizons. Some people say a whole year of rotations adds time, right? If you got into a lab and got started, maybe we'd shorten the time. So you want to know what the school's policies are. You want to know if people view the rotation experience positively, uh, how it works, how long the rotations are, et cetera. Programs vary tremendously in both the amount of their coursework and whether the coursework is required or tailored to each student, okay? So you will find programs where all first-year students take a common core curriculum, and you will find programs out there where every student sets their own curriculum, okay? You'll find programs where there are no course requirements and programs that have extensive course requirements. And again, for each of you, uh, you'll make your own judgment on what you're looking for and what you think is best for you. You just don't want to be surprised once you get there. Wait a minute, I, I, didn't, I wasn't expecting this rigid uh, curriculum. How can I get out of it? Well, you can't. Everyone takes this. Right? This you can find on the web, but you can also learn a tremendous amount about it by talking with the students. It's useful to know what the qualifying exam process is like. Will you be writing a grant, okay, which is a nice real world experience uh, for figuring out if you're moving along in your program, will you be taking an exam? Uh, what is the time frame of it? What happens uh, when students don't do well? What does the program do to help students do well? All right, so you want to know a little bit about that. And finally, something that uh, comes up very, very often uh, when students are coming down to making decisions is teaching requirements, and not only whether there are required teaching, but whether there are teaching opportunities and training in teaching or pedagogy training. So remember that first slide, where do you see yourself? If you see yourself in a job that requires teaching, you don't want to go to a graduate program that says, oh, we don't want our students to waste their time teaching. Get, get in lab, that's most important, because you're going to go up for jobs, and some of the people will have a lot of teaching experience. If teaching is important to you, you want to know that the teaching experiences are positive ones, not that you're sitting at the back of the room grading uh, bubble exams. I guess we don't use people anymore to grade bubble exams, but grading short answer exams. You want to make sure that you're going to get feedback on your teaching style. You want to make sure that in general the department and the mentors value students taking time away uh, from their research group to, to teach. All right, so I think this one, both whether there's a requirement or not, and what the opportunities are like and what the view of teaching is are ones that are often important. Jobs uh, are not uh, a guarantee, okay? Each and every one of us who moves through graduate school uh, needs guidance uh, and career services. You wanna know if it's available, okay? If there are workshops and career guidance programs available, rest assured that the program advertises it on their website because schools are very proud of the resources that they've put together in that regard. So if you don't see anything about uh, career guidance, if you don't see anything about a professional development office or professional development workshops, they probably don't happen on any regular basis. 
That said, sometimes they're coordinated outside the department. Okay? So if you go to a department's web page, you won't find it. All right? So you'll need to look a little deeply at the university and make sure uh, that you get a sense of the resources. Somebody said, I want to know whether the students are happy or not. Program climate, morale, and student satisfaction varies widely from program to program. Much to my surprise, it also varies widely within the same university between programs. Okay? So it isn't just a university culture that sets the tone for students. It's actually that program's culture that sets the tone. Okay? So this is not something that you can learn easily off of the website. Um, but you can uh, really explore that in person, and I think it is really best explored in person. Other things to consider are the diversity of the students, faculty, and broader community. Um, if you are interested in particular activities, uh, are they available on your campus? Uh, students almost never like being the only the only gay student, the only black student, the only Muslim student. Um, people want to feel part of a community, and so you'll want to check out the surrounding environment, the diversity of the students. Uh, whether diversity is something uh, you seek because uh, of your unique characteristics uh, or something you seek because we all live in a big, diverse world, and the more we uh, interact, the better off we'll be. I think it's uh, both uh, reasons for exploring diversity are really important and, and very valid. You want to know about the career goals and outcomes of past and current students. Okay? If uh, all of the students who've left have uh, left uh, unenergized and not moved on to good positions, uh, you're not likely to break the mold. Okay, if the majority of students leave for outstanding positions, whether that be postdoctoral positions uh, or employment, depending on the discipline, you'll want to know that. Do lots of the students uh, go on to various career paths, okay, or is there only one uh, valued career path? And finally, uh, somebody talked about location, and I was really pleased. Often I have to pull that out of people, um, but I, I think it matters a lot. I think it's also something you can give on, okay? So you don't like snow, but the best graduate program is up in the Northeast. Well, you can get a, a, a big, fancy, fluffy down coat and figure it out, all right? So it's something you can compromise on, but you might as well think about what matters to me, okay, and, and where would I prefer to live, and at least look there carefully. Location, I think, becomes even more important uh, if you're moving with a partner and a family, okay, particularly um, if you have kids, you know, it needs to be a positive experience for everyone. And in my time at, at uh, both UNC and here, I've seen an increasing number of graduate students moving with young children uh, or children on the younger side. Um, and I have really noticed that if they find a good supportive place for their family to land, it makes the whole experience much more positive. If you uh, are also thinking about distance from your family, um, I'll make uh, one comment. So some of us would like to live close to our families. Some of us would like to live not so close to our families. Um, it's worth thinking about. If you are used to getting a lot of support from your family or you provide a lot of support to your family or to siblings, uh, cousins, etc., and you are very far away and it's very hard to get home, that can add an element of stress. Again, that might not be the first thing on your list. In fact, each of you will have to look at all of these things and decide which ones matter to you. But I think it's important uh, to at least consider distance from family. Uh, and distance from uh, things that are important to me. Any questions about those kinds of topics in terms of picking a program? You sure? Go ahead. Thanks. Well, you can just yell it out and I'll repeat it.
So the question is on that topic there, program focus on teaching and mentoring, what can we see on a website to give us a sense that there's some focus? Um, a really, for one thing, I would say the quality of the website. Are there resources? Are there links? Are there announcements of funding opportunities? Uh, is it integrated into the university so that there's a link to the counseling center, a link to intramural sports? Um, that says they've thought about the community and the students. In terms of things surrounding scientific development, you know, are there, uh, and some, some websites aren't as uh, complete, so you'll have to wait and see, but sometimes you'll see lots of lists of student funding. You know, we're proud of these students who've won these awards. Uh, here's our upcoming symposium. Uh, on a particular scientific topic and the students are hosting these speakers. So you'll see signs that they have put attention into an experience beyond the research. In addition, uh, you might see very detailed uh, explanation of requirements. This is what we recommend for first year students. This is the second year student experience. That means someone has sat down and said, or typically some ones, a committee has sat down and said, what is a good experience for a graduate student? Okay, so in this case, I think the absence of information is very telling, right? Does that help? Yes. Okay. I, I think though that, um, that this is one that you also really get a sense of uh, on a visit, not only during, uh, not only on the web. So all of these things seem important, but I actually, uh, and I put them first not because I think they trump this, but because I think we tend to overlook all of them to focus on this slide. So I decided to order it the other way. Okay, so you can be nurtured and taken care of and people can pay attention to your progress and there can be workshops and there can be a great community. But ultimately, your success relies on your ability to do good science and to be mentored through the research experience, okay? So you also want to look at the quality of the department and the quality of the institution, okay? And by this I mean what's their funding record, okay? Are most faculty well-funded, okay? Are most faculty publishing in really good journals, okay? Not just uh, not just numbers, but quality as well, okay. One other funding element to think about is one students don't know as much about, and I wanna talk about a little bit, are training grants. So remember at the beginning I talked a little bit about MSTP programs and said if a university has an MSTP, it means an outside committee of educators came and evaluated the program, said this is a good program. In fact, it's one of the best programs, let's give it some money. There are training grants in many, many areas of uh, biomedical science. There are, and computational sciences and physical sciences as well, okay? So there are training programs uh, awarded to institutions and those are called institutional training grants. Some people will use the language institutional T32. Okay, that's the number the NIH uses in the award mechanism. When a program has a institutional training grant in cancer biology or in molecular medicine or translational medicine or cell biology, pharmacology, uh, genomics, computational biology, nutrition, you name it, that means outside experts in education and science in that area came, looked at the program and said it's a good one, all right? So, if you have an opportunity to go to a school that has a lot of training grants, you can assume a lot about the quality of training there, okay? In addition to institutional training grants, there are what are called individual training grants, and that's a student writing a grant themselves, okay, and getting it. And that also reflects very positively. Schools advertise their training grants, okay? When you go on your interviews, when you go on the website, you'll see the training grants that are there, okay? And it's generally a positive thing to get a training grant. 
I talked a little bit about publications. I'll say one other thing. Look at the faculty publications, but then also look for student publications. All right, if they publish a, the list of students on the website, if you can see students on the website, you can do this even before you go. If not, once you go, you'll meet some students. Ask them, are you publishing? Are you writing the paper? Are you first author? Are you getting help? Uh, to publish, is, has this been a positive uh, part of your graduate experience? Another way to evaluate quality is uh, awards, okay? Have students or faculty won prestigious awards? Okay, there aren't that many out there, so of everything on this list, I would say it's not the most important, but it's worth noting and paying attention to. I, you got a question? So the question is, do schools tend to have requirements for students to publish? So some PhD programs actually have uh, a requirement for a certain number of papers in order for a student to get their degree. Some schools do not because, some, because they don't want to put that burden that you have to publish, although we all agree that to be successful in a PhD program in the sciences, it's important to publish. So I, I would say, yes, some have requirements, uh, some do not. Although often it's a joint decision between the student and the mentor to publish the paper, um, it is a sign, a positive sign about a, the program if the student says they did a lot of the writing, got a lot of feedback, a lot of help. In some areas, uh, some PhD programs, typically in the humanities and in the social sciences, students often publish alone, but in the biomedical sciences, students typically publish with their mentors and other people in the research group, okay? Other questions about this? If you want to get a sense of people's grants, I gave you a website, but this is only NIH grants. So depending on your discipline, you might want to know about NSF grants, Department of Defense grants, Agriculture Department grants, uh, and so you'll need to do a little bit of digging on websites to find that. One thing to keep in mind when you look at grant databases uh, is that sometimes an investigator has funds, uh, that, but they're not the head of the grant or the principal investigator on the grant, so they might not show up. That said, you can assume uh, if, in general, a department is funded well by looking at this list. Uh, you can assume that many in faculty are funded, but you cannot assume that all of them are. So you'll still have to do your homework as you pick mentors about whether those individuals have funding and whether those individuals have the resources to support you, okay? So good institution, you're convinced this is a good institution. It's quality, it has funding, the students are moving forward. It really is, I feel like I'm heading in the right direction. Now you have to drill down to your own interests. And one thing that I would say, and I'm gonna go all the way to the bottom of the slide, is that institutions and departments have strengths in some areas, but not in all areas. So if you have a broad interest in science, you're gonna be okay at many institutions. But if you know that there is a particular model system, a particular disease process, a particular biological problem that you wanna work in, you need to look more carefully that that model system, that disease process, uh, you know, that, that uh, biological area is, is there, okay? Like I wanna do nanotechnology. Well, schools are all developing programs in nanobiology, nanotechnology, but not all schools have yet. I had a student tell me they wanted to do metabolomics, and lots of schools they looked at didn't have anything in metabolomics, right? So you're gonna have to look much more carefully when you're looking in a narrow field. If you are going to a program where you can do rotations, what you want is a good eight plus faculty whose work seems exciting to you. Do not go to a school because there's one or two people whose work really excites you. He or she might get a job somewhere else. He or she might not have money. He or she might not be a very good mentor. 
Okay? So it may seem perfect on the website, but not so perfect when you actually uh, ask if you can work there or actually try it out and find out that you don't like it. If you are applying to a program where you have to pick your advisor up front, that really changes things. And obviously, you don't need 8 to 10 to choose from. You need a smaller number of people willing to engage with you at the outset of the process. In that case, you'll want to focus much, much more on individual faculty before you consider some of these other broader elements. All right, so depending on the program and depending whether there's rotations, you'll change a little the energy that you're going to put into different areas. All right, questions about evaluating the quality, looking for what you want, uh, making sure that, that uh, the quality in your area is there? So the question was, what about proximity to other institutions? And they could actually even be academic, right? Do, do two universities have a lot of collaborations? Or industry or a research uh, institution uh, that's close by. A lot of schools with pride announce opportunities for students to rotate and do dissertation work uh, off campus, okay? And the NIH Graduate Partnerships Program is a real example of that where universities allow students to work here at NIH, but you can find many examples. Uh, Brown University, for example, will allow students to go to the marine biology labs. There are universities with industry connections that allow students to do industry rotations. I think that that can be a very, very big plus, and if you are interested in an industry career, it is worth exploring whether there are programs um, that have those connections. Um, I don't know, for many of you, if you would put that uh, as number one on your list, but sometimes access to a very unique resource down the road is a, is a real plus. So that's a great thing to point out. Ah, I'm sorry, I didn't even talk about that. So the question was to please elaborate on uh, this last point, the ratio of senior to junior faculty. So that tells you something about the, where the department is. If everyone is uh, tenure track but not tenured yet, uh, that has some inherent risks of how people's careers will develop. That said, it also has some real inherent strengths that working with young investigators who are still at the bench, still remember, you know, life as a graduate student is really a plus as well. So I don't actually mean you want a place with a lot of senior people because junior people are a risk. I also don't mean you want a place with a lot of junior people because senior people are a risk. It's just that a, the ratio tells you will there be a lot of turnover, uh, is there stability? Um, if everyone is senior, have they reached a point in their career where they're less interested in mentoring, uh, et cetera? Okay. Good question. Anything else? All right. So you have all these factors. Lots and lots of postbacks show up in my office with a spreadsheet you know, where they list the different factors and the things that matter to them. Some have geographically very much restricted themselves, some for family purposes, some for, because of partners. Some are going to search together with a partner, and so they're looking in places where there are multiple schools. Some don't even have location on there. They're looking all over. Some have an absolute requirement for uh, teaching opportunities. Some say, not that important to me. Some say, I need a great proteomics facility. Some say, I need access to um, patient populations uh, in autism. You each will have your own spreadsheet, but I hope you will make one, all right? So that you can find the right schools, apply to the right schools, and eventually go to the right school. So to learn about schools and programs, what are you going to do? Start with your mentors, OK? And by that, I mean not only the PI of your lab, I mean the graduate students, the postdocs, mentors from undergrad, mentors that you've met across campus, 
Okay, talk to a lot of people. One, warning, we all talk warmly, or many of us at least talk warmly, of the school we went to. Okay, we went there, let me tell you about it, you should go there. Okay, that can be great to hear someone's enthusiasm for a program, but it doesn't make the program right for you. All right, in addition, uh, many individuals know about one area of the country, but not another. All right, if you're looking for science in a particular discipline, you can say, do you have any colleagues on the West Coast? What schools would you recommend? All right, talk to people, talk to a lot of people. The NIH alumni database has a lot of postbacks who've graduated and went on to school. So you can go to the alumni database and search for schools. One thing I'll tell you is the database needs a little bit of work that's happening right now, but hasn't happened yet. So if you can't find what you're looking for, uh, just come back and check again in a week or so. I think it will be um, probably all uh, fixed within a week. Surf the web. This is a great time to just go to a school's website, go to the program's website, hit on links. Let me see the faculty list. Let me see, oh, there's a list of students and where they've ended up. Here's workshops that they have. Here's information on uh, funding opportunities at that school. So surf the web. If there's an undergraduate meeting, the Council for Undergraduate Research, the Annual Biomedical Research Conference for Minority Students, uh, a, a meeting that in your discipline, uh, American Society for Cell Biology has a lot of information on graduate student opportunities, the Biophysical Society, try to go to a meeting. I know that can be hard. If the meeting is far away, I know postbacs are not always at the top of the list for PIs to pay, but if the meeting is close by, uh, maybe you can figure out a way to get there. You can contact people at schools that, that catch your interest. You can email the program directors, you can email administrators, you can email students, or you can email individual faculty members, okay? Some people do a lot of this in advance. I happen to not be a big fan of that. I think it can take a lot of time and until you have a better sense of the school, uh, I don't know that you need to be hearing from individual uh, faculty about a slot in their research group. Other people differ with me on that and think it's a great idea that you get a sense of uh, research groups that might excite you. So you'll decide for yourself. And if you're going to contact people, send very clean, crisp, well-written emails, okay? Don't be unprepared. Likewise, if you're going to be near a school, go visit, but only if you're prepared. All right. A bad impression during a pre-interview is still a bad impression and someone will remember it. All right. Finally, one thing I would encourage you not to do is do not use U.S. News and World Report rankings. Okay. They're interesting. It can be a fun article to read, but it is a very incomplete story about what's going on. Uh, in, in graduate education. People you communicate with, I listed all of these already. I want to make one point for all of you to keep in mind. In some graduate programs, the director of recruiting is the director of the program. All right? And in other graduate programs, the director of recruiting does recruiting, gets you in, and hands you off to a program director. And that's fine. Both models work. It's uh, uh, really doesn't make any difference to you. But what does matter to you is if there's a director of recruiting, you want to make sure to meet the director of the program when you visit the campus, okay? If you're going to write individual faculty and individual students, appreciate that people are very busy, uh, but no one is more warm and engaging than during the application and interview process, right? So if you're not getting responses when you're a prospective student, don't expect that suddenly you will get responses when you show up there as a graduate student, all right? So don't expect everyone to respond tomorrow with the most warm, friendly, engaging email, but pay attention to whether you're getting responses or not, okay? 
So that's all I have to say about um, actually picking schools. I'm going to transition a little bit to talking about applications. And what I'd like to do is, if there are any questions, throw them out there right now. All right, if not, let's all stretch our legs for five minutes, and then we will come back uh, and go through the second half of the talk. All right. Yeah, give me a warning when I got. Yeah, I have a 5 o'clock meeting, so I need to be really on time. So maybe at 20 till. Okay, any questions anybody thought about while they were um, outside? Yes. So the question was, I'm, I'm going to, because we're not catching it on tape, so I'll cut you off, and then if I don't get it right, you'll tell me. The question is, how are ways, besides asking students to get a sense of how engaged faculty members are in mentoring? And in reality, um, that's a really hard thing to tell on a website. It's almost an impossible thing to tell on a website. Um, so you can look at their publication record and do they have students on papers. You can look at whether their students go out to meetings and they go together and they introduce students. You know, you can look at a lot of things, but those are not reflected on a website. Um, so, so the most important thing to keep in mind with that is A, go and talk to people and get a sense uh, when you're on campus about the relationships. But most importantly, take that, if you go to a program that allows rotations, take that opportunity uh, very seriously. So a lot of times students choose rotations and they aren't attuned enough to the mentoring going on. They aren't attuned enough to the environment that's around them. They're focused, A, you're running between classes and other things and working in the lab, so you're scattered in a lot of directions, so it's easy to ignore the environment around you. But B, you also tend to get focused on, am I going to get a piece of data, another piece of data, is that going to add up to something exciting? And you don't pay attention to, are there easy and uh, regular interactions, is lab meeting a positive but critical environment? And so it's really something that you can't tell so much on the website. My thought in just making that comment is it tells you about the life and health of a department, that they're both bringing up young people who are developing and that there's a senior base, okay? And that really all, all you want is a program that has a mix of people at every step along the way, okay? So the question, the question is, how important is it to choose a lab where they already have had, where they have students right then? So, so obviously, if you can talk to people who've left the lab, uh, particularly graduate students who've moved on, right, in a positive way to the next step, you can learn a lot about what life can be like for a graduate student there. All right. But that would preclude ever going with the brand new faculty member whose work really excites you. And the reality is that that can be a really remarkable experience. And so I think you want to get a sense of, of people in their interactions with you. If they have students, you want to take those students away from the lab, have coffee, and ask hard questions, direct questions, to get a, a sense of things. You want to contact people who have left the lab if you can, okay? But ultimately, you're going to have to go with some gut feeling if 
there isn't a long history there. All right. That's where I think rotations are such a gift to students. As much as I, I there's a pull there because finishing quickly is, is important too. So I think short rotations are better than ones that go on a long, long, long time. Um, but you know, you can pick someone who doesn't have much of a mentoring record. And if you have a very positive experience and they're really engaged in the department and it's clear they want to learn about how to bring your graduate students successfully through, then it can be a real winning experience. Okay. I think the first group of students that joined my lab still have these great memories of unpacking things together and our first meeting and our first paper and our first, you know, sort of our first everything. Um, that, that you don't, you know, it's nice to, you don't always get to experience that setting up a lab. So there are real pluses to junior faculty members. All right. All right, so let's transition a little bit to preparing a strong application. All right, and I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because you're going to write a lot about this in your uh, statements, and Pat's going to address personal statements coming up soon. But I wanted to give you some questions and prompts to work with as you're thinking about yourself and as you're thinking about this process. Whether it be for writing your statement or whether it be because you're going to go on interviews and people are going to say, so tell me about yourself. Why should we accept you? I just wanted to give you some questions uh, that people tell me are very, very, uh, that can sometimes trump them, but are also very useful for preparing for the process. Okay, I want to stress after you go through all of these, which are all about me, okay, I, 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 here's how I got prepared that you want to take one minute, step outside of yourself, and think about the school. Why that school and why that program, OK? And it never ceases to amaze me. I have interviewed so many people for graduate school. It never ceases to amaze me when that trips someone up, because it's such an obvious question that, that you're going to get. So you want to think a lot about yourself, OK? You want to think a lot about why that school and program and you're going to reflect that in your emails to people. You're going to reflect this in your uh, statement. You're going to reflect it while you're uh, networking and socializing at the interview. You're going to reflect the answers to these questions uh, actually in formal interviews. OK, so we won't go one by one. But uh, as you write your personal statement and in that workshop, you will go much more in depth. All right, so let me give you a picture of us. OK, so what's an admissions committee look like? So I have seen admissions committee as small as five people and admissions committee as large as 15 members, okay? They are typically a combination of uh, junior faculty and more senior faculty. They involve sometimes, but not all the time, a student, okay? In fact, I would say um, more often than not, uh, there is no student. Um, but there are some that have, so I want to throw that out there. They are chaired by either the program director or a director of admissions, and they have assistance from an administrative person who is often the contact person or face of the program. I want to remind you that your interactions with the administrative person should be as respectful and cordial as your interactions with the director of the program, okay? Because they often have been on the committee a long time and people will turn to them and say, we're not sure about this one. What is, how's your interaction been? OK? The applications are read in advance and typically discussed at a meeting. OK? So people are going to make a judgment about you on paper, and then they're going to go to a meeting, and they're going to decide who to invite, who to offer admissions to, who doesn't fit, uh, who doesn't meet criteria, et cetera. Some but not all graduate programs use rolling admissions. So this is in there to say if you can get your application in early and a program uses rolling admissions, good for you. Rolling admissions means they start reading applications right, at the, you know, right after the deadline or even some before, and they keep evaluating them the whole way. So what I noticed uh, when I was directing the uh, one of the committees was we were much more likely early on to give someone the benefit of the doubt. Well, we still have room for 60 more people to interview. Let's just meet this guy, 
All right, we're not sure, but let's meet him. But towards the end, when most of the positions are full, it got a little bit hard, harder to get an offer. So if you can be early, uh, early on, you know, in the process, the better. That does not mean you have to frantically run around tomorrow and submit. Now is too early, okay? Way too early, all right? No one's going to be looking, or most people are not going to be looking. One other point I want to make is that these committees vote often, okay? There are some democratic process, but there is also some element of discretion of the program director, all right? So if you have a, a flaw in your application, all right, it is worth discussing it with the program director. It is worth putting it in your essay. It's worth pursuing it with the program director, okay? Because sometimes he or she has some discretion to help people understand that, all right? So you're writing to everyone, but if there are issues, you want to bring them up, uh, if you can, with the program director, okay? What are we looking for? Academic record, standardized test scores, research experience, research statement, and recommendation letters, okay? If you are applying for a program that has some clinical certification element to it, we're looking for that clinical experience as well. Every member of a search committee will order this list differently. So some think standardized test scores mean a lot. Some people think they don't mean as much. Some are very forgiving of a bad semester of grades, thinking, oh, you know, that was a, um, due to something going on in his or her personal life. Some admissions committee members are not forgiving, all right? Some read the personal statement and find every grammatical mistake and count them up. Some skim the research statement and say, this sounds good, I liked it. We're all different, okay? And so you can't assume one thing here matters more than another, all right? You need to start working on letters of recommendation now, so I wanted to bring it up right up, up front. Almost always three, but occasionally students have come back and told me there was a fourth required. Online systems are a little less flexible, all right? So if you put in three people and someone doesn't deliver for you, there's no way to have another person replace them unless you go in and change your online application. So you want to go and talk to people now, make sure they know about the deadlines, and then you want to stay on top of them and make sure uh, that you submit on time. So I write a fair number of letters of recommendation, and I've noticed two kinds of personalities. All right? There are people who hound me every day. All right? I get an email every day. I just want to remind you of this deadline. I just want to remind you. And every day might be an exaggeration, but I, I would say they... Uh, are very uh, assertive in making sure their letter gets in. Some ask for a letter, and then I never hear from them again, okay? So out of sight, out of mind, and then I get embarrassingly close to the deadline or miss the deadline and uh, have to apologize. You do not want to be a person who doesn't follow up at all because you may not get a letter in on time. But you also don't want to be the student uh, who's hounding someone every day, all right? So some regular uh, contact. If you ask three months in advance, a reminder at two months and then at one month would be appropriate. But then it's starting to get serious and a reminder each week would be okay. If it's f five days before the deadline or a week before the deadline and you're not getting a response back from that person, that's when you want to consider is there someone else I can ask. You don't want to consider is there someone else on the last day, all right? You want to ask far in advance, okay? And you want uh, to make sure you're going to get good letters. So you want to ask from mentors and teachers who know you well. Notice I'm screaming at you. All right, that's capital letters, all right? I meant to use capital letters, all right? Not from personal or family friends. It does not matter if they claim to know you in a more professional way, all right? Not if 
you can help it not from non-educational employers, okay? That doesn't hold if the work is highly relevant, okay? So if you worked, if you're applying to a clinical psychology program and you worked uh, at, uh, on an abuse hotline, that's highly relevant. So that would be an appropriate letter, all right? You will absolutely need to explain why you don't have a letter from your post back mentor and or a mentor that you did significant undergraduate research with. So if you're sitting here thinking, oh, that's a problem, we didn't get along, things didn't go so well, please make an appointment and come and talk with us about it. Uh, we can strategize, we can figure out uh, solutions uh, early enough that you can line up the letters that you need and resolve uh, those issues. Some students will email me and ask for a letter and I'll say, sure, I'm happy to do it, and they don't follow up by sending me an updated CV or resume. It's much easier to write a letter for someone if I have their statement and their and a reminder of what they've accomplished. Okay, obviously if it's in, um, you know, someone in my lab, I don't need those reminders quite as much. But if you've left and you're going back to an undergraduate professor, someone you did summer research, give them the reminder that they need. <coughs> okay, so you want to make sure to follow up if someone says yes with, um, with some information that will help them write it. Sometimes I'll say yes and someone says, great, put it in an envelope and send it to me, all right? And there are some PIs who will do that, but many of us will not. Don't take it in a negative way. Just say, great, I'll send you the list. And in fact, I would suggest that you not ask for the letter. The majority of them now are submitted online anyway. You cannot submit them on your own behalf. Only we can submit them using the password that the university sends us. So I would tell you to not worry about that. Contact people, they uh, just get their agreement, follow up with them, uh, send them the material, and let them worry about it online. If your PI or a teacher says, sure, I'll write you a letter, you write it for me, and then I'll make changes, that would be a great time to make an appointment uh, with Pat or I, and we can help you uh, put some things on paper uh, that become the, the meat of a, of a letter. Another strategy for that is to go to the postdoc or grad student in your lab and say, could you do me a favor and just write a little bit about me that I can give to Dr. So-and-so uh, to help her or him write the letter. All right, that stresses people out, so I always like to mention it. Uh, it happens uh, a fair amount. Uh, at every level, not only graduate school letters of recommendation, but even beyond. Questions about getting letters? Always lots. I should start the workshop with recommendation letters and we'd have lots of discussion. Go ahead. So, um, is it okay to use non-science-based? The question is, is it okay to use non-science-based professors? And I would say, if you have to, it's okay, but you should try not to, okay? You want to ask people who know you well, okay? Um, so working in their lab, going, uh, ha taking a class with them that had a, a paper-based, discussion-based, research-based uh, element to it is much better than a non-science faculty member, okay? But if somebody who knows you really, really well is not a scientist and they feel that they can address your ability to perform in a science graduate program, then I would say it's worth thinking about. All right. Other questions? Uh, no, you. Um, you mentioned about the post back mentor, how you just take them to your letter. Like, I just started three weeks ago. Great. So. Okay. So that's a great question. Happens to a lot of people. So I just started three weeks ago. Now what do I do? So what I would say is anyway, you need to sit down and talk about your time here, right? You got to set expectations and get a sense of what you're gonna do. In that meeting, you would want to share that my goal is to go to graduate school and I'm going to apply this year. I appreciate that you don't know me well enough yet, but would you be open to writing a letter in a couple of months? 
because the letters do not have to get in super early. Okay? That could get in on the last day. Uh, most schools give a grace period for faculty like me who can't pay attention to deadlines. So they don't, you don't need that letter now. What you need is a commitment for them to consider it. Okay? And I think you'll be fine. Many, many postbacs have worked it out that way. Occasionally a mentor has said it's just not long enough and they've gone to undergraduate mentors. Okay? Question in the back. Uh, if you don't work closely with an actual PI, you work more with like a postdoc, does that make a difference? Okay. So the question is if you don't work with the PI, you work with a postdoc, what should you do? And it'll be interesting. Um, I would imagine lots of people have a different opinion than me. I think that having a letter from the head of the lab is really valuable. And if your postdoc can provide input to the head of the lab and they can either jointly submit the letter or your PI can say, the postdoc who supervises Shane tells me this and this, it's really uh, more valuable. I also think you should use every opportunity possible to make a good impression, which means if you're at a joint lab meeting together, you don't want to be at the back of the room, uh, you know, catching up on, on your sleep. You want to try to build on those small opportunities to make a good impression. I would also be somewhat assertive and ask for a meeting to talk about your career goals so that they are aware that a letter for graduate school would help a lot. All right. Some people, I think, would say get the letter from the postdoc who can really go on in su with superlatives and talk about you. But I think there's something to be said for a senior scientist saying, I've had lots of postbacks and here's, he here's where he fits. So going out of your way to try to get it is worth it. That said, plenty of postbacks have done fine with letters from staff scientists and postdocs. Okay? So if that's what you get, that's fine also. Okay? You and then you. Um, on that same note, um, would it be appropriate to get one from both? Or like you said, just have one and have them both signed? So would it be appropriate to get a letter from both? Depending on who else you have, that might be a really good idea. Um, but it's also a fine idea to co-sign them. So I typically uh, get uh, text from the postdoc or staff scientist and then we co-submit the letter. Because I know my postbacs in a much more formal context. I'm not seeing them in lab as much as I wish I was. And so uh, every lab will do it different. Again, if you ask for All right, and, and get letters from the best people. You had a question, right? Oh, I the same, question. same question. Wow, excellent. Go ahead. So I, uh, I don't think it's a great strategy to ask people to give you a letter out the door. So a lot of us are queasy about doing that, um, um, in part to protect you that, that I write a letter for a graduate school that's different than if you change your goals and want to do something else. Some people are just not comfortable handing the letters to the student. Um, so you might, someone might be willing to do it, but in general it's dated a year back and that's not very useful. So what I would recommend is that you leave, that six months after you've left, or three months, you send an update. A little while after that, you send another update. And then in your next update, you say, as you know, I'll be applying to graduate school. So I have written letters for people who left my lab 10 years ago. Now, when I can't write a letter is when they haven't kept in touch at all. And I can barely remember who they are. And you might think, how could you not remember me? But if you have five or six undergraduates a year and someone doesn't keep in touch, you're not likely to remember them. And in general, the ones you remember, it's not for good things. So you want to keep in touch. 
a little bit like the warning letter about you don't want to keep in touch so much that they feel like you haven't left and you're stalking them, but you don't want to wait until you need the letter and then say, hey, don't forget me, I need the letter. Okay? So keep in touch. Uh, is there a number that's too many to ask for one PI? So actually, to be honest, the schools want you to personalize why this school. They don't care if the recommender addresses that school or not. Okay. So in all honesty, uh, those of us who write a lot of letters say, I am writing to recommend so-and-so for admission to your school. We don't even put the name of the school in. Um, everyone is aware that writing letters can become a burden, and the, the schools aren't wishing for personalization. Okay, now, there might be a time when personalization would really help a particular program. Um, I have a postback who's going to apply to a computational program, uh, and some that are not computational, and I think I'm going to write a slightly different letter for the more computational programs. So there are times when some personalization would help. If you are a good, honest, solid postbac who's contributing to the lab, your mentor will be delighted. And now that there are computers, this is just not that hard. Okay, so, so you don't want to apply to 20 schools. 20 is too many because you can't accommodate them. Okay, trust me, you can't go on that many interviews. So although MD, PhD, I, I typically do tell people to do quite a number. But PhD, uh, 8 to 10 is even a lot. It's not too many. OK. There was one more. How much weight can you place on the reputation of the writer within your field? So that's, a, that's one where, you know, going back to that list where I said people will reorder it, I'll tell you that in committees I've served on, the name can sway some people, and some are totally unimpressed. They'll say, well, he's too busy to really know the student, or she writes that for everyone. You know, I think you want people who genu genuinely know you, and beyond that, I wouldn't worry. If you know a very influential person in your field, but you know them very tangentially and very uh, superficially, they can't write you a good letter. So them writing a letter isn't a big help. All right. I wouldn't worry. Get people who know you, who can talk about your passions, who can talk about your strengths, who can point out what some of your weaknesses are and how you've tried to fix them, and you will be fine. Okay? If it turns out to be your postdoc, you're going to be fine. Okay? If it turns out to be teachers from undergraduate because your PI says you haven't been here long enough, you're still going to be fine. One thing I would say, if you went to a very small liberal arts college that people might not know about, it does not help if the instructor, in the instructor, if the letter writer says, although you may not have heard of us, we have a very active undergraduate research program. All of our students write a, a research-based honors project. Okay, so sometimes giving a little information about the program goes a long way. Okay. The goal of your written application is to get an interview. And I have seen people with meticulous grades fall flat because they don't have a good essay and they didn't get their letters in. Okay, so pay attention to all of that. If the goal is to get an interview, missing deadlines and asking for an extension is a poor way to make a good impression. We occasionally overlook it, but why? Okay, if you know you're going to apply, it's online, you know that the computer sometimes misbehaves, don't wait till 1150 to hit submit when something's due at midnight. All right, start early. Anyway, it's a benefit. Right, to get it done with and move on. But definitely, if you don't start early, at least don't wait to the last minute. You can apply to too many schools, but you can also apply to too few schools. It depends a little bit on the program. Okay? Uh, clinical psychology uh, typically takes a higher number of schools uh, than, than PhD programs in the biosciences. That said, 
your record determines the right number of schools for you. All right, so there is no magic number. What I can tell you is you will be exhausted if you go on 10 to 12 interviews and you will be rather unpopular with your uh, lab when you're out so much. It's a pretty exhausting process, so don't have too many low, uh, low on your list safety schools uh, and don't make it all these high reach schools and then you're disappointed at the end of the year, okay? And finally, I think this is a stressful process for everyone, even for really strong students. It's still something you haven't experienced before. It's something done in a backdrop of intensity in the lab. So just because you're applying doesn't mean that everyone in your research group leaves you alone. So waiting till the last minute and not getting help and guidance really adds to the stress. I have seen students just thrive during this process. They learn a lot about themselves. They develop some real confidence. They meet fun people that will be colleagues for life. So I still am in touch with some people that I interviewed for graduate school with, okay? This is, can be a remarkably fun and exciting time, but it can be a stressful one. So reach out to mentors. Uh, folks in the OITE, folks in your training office, in your institute, folks in your branch, get advice from a lot of people, go back to your undergraduate mentors, get their feedback and advice, and do whatever you can to minimize your stress. Um, go ahead, question. Um, what's the way to determine if someone's a reach school or a So that can be really a difficult thing uh, to determine because some of it is based on numbers, but some of it is based on publications and uh, um, research experiences. So really the best way to judge that is to talk to people who have broad knowledge of graduate programs. The other thing, those of you who are year, here a year in advance, you're going to apply next year, uh, this summer will be, as every summer, the graduate and professional school fair. And my feedback from the exhibitors is they're pretty honest with students about whether they have a good shot or not. You can email a school and get a sense, uh, you know, ask them for an evaluation of your record. Um, talk to people who went there. Uh, you can go in the alumni database. Maybe you'll find someone that's already there. Um, what people are loath to tell you is an absolute cutoff, okay? No one will say less than this GPA or GREs, no, because we all look at the entire package. All right. So if the GRE sub subject test is recommended, not required, what to do? That's the question. So I think it depends. If in general the rest of your application is very strong and your general GREs and your GPA are very strong, I say don't risk it, okay? If, however, you have a blemish in your record, okay, by, a, you know, a, a, a lower GPA or GREs that you're a little disappointed with, sometimes that a good score on the subject test can balance that out. And so I think you have to make that decision a little bit knowing uh, yourself and how you're going to do. So I would take a subject test under the most realistic conditions you can, see how you do on it, factor in everything else in your record, and then decide. All right. If it says strongly recommended, just white out strongly recommended and put in required and take it, okay? Strongly recommended means go ahead, all right? I know at the beginning you mentioned that for a national public health website, um, what I'm finding is that there's a So on that website that I gave here is a lot of career information. On our video cast is career information as well as getting into graduate school information. You'll find a lot of resources. Much of what I said really applies. A couple of differences. So public health 
has uh, an international element, and they are often looking for students with a significant amount of leadership experience and international experience. Uh, obviously, languages can make a big difference uh, to schools of public health, depending on what area you're interested in. So there are a few differences. Well, really, it's just things I didn't stress that I would stress if I was talking to someone interested in public health. But a lot of what I said applies, and that website and that video, I think, will both really enhance this. Okay? Uh, we will have a workshop on writing personal statements for graduate school in Building 50 on October 5th from noon to 1.30 that Pat uh, Sokoloff will be leading. And uh, both Pat and I are more than happy to talk with you about REACH schools, about things in your application, about picking schools, about how to um, attack this process. In fact, I would say we both enjoy these meetings quite a bit. Um, Pat was the associate dean at Maryland or assistant? Associate. She was the associate dean of the graduate school in Maryland, and I have been on admissions committees both uh, at UNC Chapel Hill and here uh, at NIH. So we will share our experience. We will also try uh, to share with you, uh, you know, what is sort of good general strategy and what is our opinion. Okay, it's very, very important to distinguish someone's own individual opinion from, from the rest of the advice that you get. We'll try to be as uh, uh, available as possible. But it gets a little bit chaotic at this time of the year. And so this is, if you want to talk about graduate school, this is what you need to do. Okay, that's Barbara. Ward B is Barbara Ward, Barbara in my office. Okay, you email Barbara, put in the subject line, graduate school, okay, and tell her you would like to have a meeting to talk about your graduate school applications. If there's something important in there, I'm interested in X discipline, you know, tell us whatever you want, and then Barbara and I and Pat will work to get you scheduled uh, with one of us as quickly as possible. The Career Center is available. Debbie has contacts at graduate schools all over the place. Uh, so if you're looking for a student or a faculty member somewhere, uh, an email to Debbie can go a long way. The alumni database, it's not quite ready, but I still think it will be helpful for you. And we can go in the back end and find information if you can't find it. Your PIs, many of them went to graduate school, the postdocs and grad students. Uh, have experiences to share with you. What I would say is enjoy this process, but treat it really seriously. Because landing in the right graduate school can launch your career, and landing in the wrong place can really uh, be a drain. So we want you to choose wisely. This is the beginning of that process. We'll have a workshop on interviewing uh, in November. And then we will actually give you all a break to go and interview. And this year, we're going to add a workshop on actually getting there and making the transition and succeeding. One last thing, there is a video cast on our website, which is a panel of deans uh, of schools uh, outside of the uh, programs, not GPP programs, talking about strategies for interviewing, et cetera. So use the online resources. If you are in Baltimore, Frederick, Rocky Mountain Labs, uh, North Carolina watching on video, uh, we will meet with you by phone. I will be actually traveling quite a bit to uh, most of those campuses. So please also email and ask for appointments. Uh, either phone or in person will work. Uh, likewise, if you came here from Twin Brook or Executive Plaza, uh, and you would prefer not to come and would like to meet by phone, Pat and I are happy to do that as well. So, Pat, do I have time for a few more questions or? Okay, I have time for two more questions if there are any. All right, your questions tell me you're ready, okay? These were good questions. All right, so go out and kick butt. Good luck. You could shut off right before the kick butt would be OK. I almost didn't say it. See, I debated not saying it.